Louisiana versus all y'all's recruit that boot. Jarrett Roser with Sam Spiegelman hitting on a lot of topics that are unfolding pretty quickly. Uh, this is Wednesday, May 29th. And so we're just a few hours removed from the official announcement of James Simon committing to Texas. We've got the new LSU offer for a shot Sterling. Uh, just kind of checking in a little bit and any further updates on DeCorey and Moore. We're hearing a little bit of buzz regarding that. So some familiar names we've hit on in the past that we'll be kind of doing some updates on as well as potentially at the end, if we've got some time, just kind of a quick look at some, some major updates from the NCAA standpoint uh, late last week. And so Sam, I think we initially had some other plans for this, but there's just a lot happening really quickly. How's your end of May treating you with, uh, with news hitting, relatively fast and furious uh it's it, it's here right the summer is now probably one of the craziest times of the year as far as the recruiting cycle you know on one hand you have camp season just kicking into gear i know that you're probably going to be uh uptown or in br not too long uh for for the the many camps that are about to start taking place i know you and i talked off air that's you know we're kind of figuring out some of the places where we'll overlap this this summer, um, a lot of a lot of big events in that same vein, and we're going to talk about OT seven and more uh, next week. That was obviously one of the the topics that we we are definitely going to touch on. Um, but it's also pivotal for official visits for some of the top twenty twenty fives in the country. Um, if if you're not taking one or two visits, you're taking three or possibly four. And if you're ambitious enough, you're doing a midweek visit. Maybe you're doing five, or you did something last week. You know, it's just been it's nonstop. You know, just think just trying to take a look at some of the players uh, that we talk about on this podcast and many that we haven't even touched on that are hitting the road all across the country. Um, listen, so I think my biggest takeaway from this time last year was a lot of kids committed after their first or second OV. They were like, that's enough. I, you know, my mind is made up. And, um, you know, that obviously opens the door for either a lot of early recruitment shutting down or a lot of drama back late, uh, close to the end of the cycle. But, um, you know, fireworks are about to go off in June and then even more in July. And, it's just a really fun time, but no, it is certainly not without many dull moments. Yeah, I I tell people all the time, it's funny to me how, I mean, still, after however long of doing this, I have family members that kind of, as football season ends in the winter, they wonder, okay, well, so you're like pretty, pretty free now. There's nothing going on until August, and I try to let them realize that it is maybe busier in the spring and summer in a lot of ways because without the games kind of honing everything in and knowing, all right, here's the set schedule of building toward Friday night and then reset and week by week, it's just kind of chaos for a lot of the year. And we're, we're really in the thick of that now. Yeah, probably the biggest difference between the off season and the real season is you can take a week off, maybe one weekend off per month and kind of have it to yourself. But um, that doesn't that doesn't guarantee that news isn't going to happen, that um, that, you know, big news isn't behind the corner. So, you know, go at your own rate. It's 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 not for everyone. But the older they get, you realize there's not a lot of free weekends anymore. The big news today, as I mentioned, James Simon announces his commitment to Texas. If we were keeping a leaderboard of who's been mentioned the most in the early months of Recruit That Boot, James is certainly up there, if not the the leader in the clubhouse. Uh, James commits to Texas over home state LSU, Alabama, Texas A&M, and Notre Dame. And we kind of talked about how this was trending this direction for a long time, but is now official and obviously a, a really nice get for Coach Sarkeesian and, and B. Harris and, and everybody out there that is, has been a part of this recruiting process uh, out in Austin. And uh, LSU has – some guys on board, but watch is one of the top prospects in the state head elsewhere. Just kind of reactions now that this is, you know, official as it can be for a verbal commitment. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing that I got, um, James, James told me that his mind was sort of made up by March. So at that point he had kind of visited Texas in January. He had been to LSU. He had, um, you know, he, he had, he had made his way around to see A&M and Notre Dame and Alabama before making this decision. But and returning to Texas uh, a month ago, but um, his mind was made up in March. Um, you know, I, is it is it real? Is it going to hurt LSU? You know, we'll, we'll we'll know down the road. But in terms of what it, what Texas is getting, I mean, they have a fantastic one-two punch in that in that running back room for 2025. Uh, Ricky Stewart is a guy that they flipped earlier in this cycle um, from East Texas, and Tyler, um, who I got to see in the state championships, is really impressive. 
Um, definitely one of those guys that I highlighted afterward, but um, you know, who was the MVP for me after the state championships in new Orleans last year. And um, I think James, you know, this is a, we've talked again, we're beating the bush on this. It's a really special running back group in Louisiana this cycle, but James is my favorite of the, as far as three down backs go, I think he can do everything. Um, I think he is a ready to go prospect at just North of six foot and 200 pounds. I think even though he's got the size and, and the ability to, you know, rewatching some of the, some of those plays uh, in the Superdome, he's got the ability to move defenders off the ball and, um, you know, create on his own, but he's also has some tremendous shake. Um, we've got to see in the seven on seven setting, how good of a pass catcher he is. We've seen that a little bit in regular season action up there in the Shreve a little bit. Um, and I just think that his future is so bright with someone like Steve Sarkeesian calling the plays. Um, I think just and a big credit, you mentioned Brandon Harris, um, the GM of Texas, the GM. Um, but there's a lot of Louisiana flavor. Terry Joseph is a part of this recruitment. The Shard Choice has been recruiting some of the best backs in the country the past few years. And I think Sark, at the end of the day, had a really big role in sealing the deal here. Now that that the commitment announcement has actually occurred, anytime one of these neighboring or, or nearby programs pulls a big prospect out of the state. And certainly when there's a, a little bit of a trend with some of the success the Longhorns have had in some, some recent cycles as well. I think for LSU fans, part of the question becomes more than just that guy leaving. And should they be concerned about the inroads being made into the state by a program? What is your thought on the success Texas has had, in some spots, but some some really key spots, obviously, to pull some some top guys out of Louisiana the last what three or four cycles. They've done just that, and it's been two or three daggers of of players that you know. At least I can speak for myself that I've been really high on. It starts with getting Arch and Derek Williams, and then getting a guy like Wardell Mack last year. Um, you know, they were really heavily involved in the Dominic McKinley sweepstakes uh, in the summer, and then again toward the the, the back end. Um, and, and someone like James this year is, you know, it's, it's someone that you don't want to let leave the state, you know, like LSU has a fantastic one, two punch in their own backfield with, um, Harlan Berry, the number one running back in the country, the most electrifying, you know, back, uh, there, that, that, that we've seen in the state. And then, uh, JT Lindsay, who has had a fantastic off season, a fantastic junior season is a really, really good four-star player, um, four-star, you know, prospect rather. Um, and I, I'm really excited to see what his senior season looks like, you know, but, James is, he seems destined to have just a really great college career when you pair him with a great offensive mind, um, you know, and, and really great coaching and coach choice. I, you know, I just think that the world is, is going to be in, in James's hands. Um, I, Texas definitely has made in rooms. They have a lot of Louisiana flavor. That's what we've been trying to hint at. Brandon Harris knows how to evaluate players. Terry Joseph knows how to recruit players. Steve Sarkeesian from what, you know, from, from talking to guys in the state of Texas and in our state, um, even though I don't live there, I'm still claiming it. You know, he's a real calm, cool customer. He's got, you know, California cool vibes. And um, I can tell you from talking to guys that have committed to Texas, guys that have signed there and guys that have really just been high on them. And even if they didn't sign there, they he, he makes the difference. He's a real calm customer and he's very involved in these recruitments. And I think he's one of the best recruiting head coaches that's in the country. From one big prospect in the state who LSU was involved with, but is now heading elsewhere to another notable prospect in this 2025 class that we've talked about. We talked about when he committed to Houston, Rashad Sterling, the standout edge rusher from Lutcher. He picks up on Tuesday an offer from LSU that I think is, is a real game changer in his recruiting process as it is for, for most Louisiana prospects had a chance to talk to Rashad on Tuesday and, and he insisted, you know, I'm still committed to the Cougars. I, I really appreciate these relationships, but you know, you never know with, with the recruiting process. And and this is a lot to kind of take in and he'll be on campus in Baton Rouge on Sunday. So a lot could happen pretty quickly. Thoughts on whether you expect, uh, you know, a, a Houston signing for Rashad long-term or, or how much and how quickly does this LSU offer shake up things for the, the Lutcher standout? Yeah. First of all, I think, you know, I think Houston won the, the first round. Um, I, I, you know, I think Tulane was coming really hard. Um, other schools were involved in, in Rashad's recruitment before he committed to, to Houston, but LSU flirted with him and right at the beginning of the year, he was on campus and there was a lot of buzz that he might be one of the first commitments in this 2025 class with, with, you know, 
with Jabari, Jabari Antoine and, and Harlem Berry and uh, and Devin Harper. They kind of wanted Rashad to maybe commit early, and then they seemed like maybe they were going in a different direction. But um, and so credit Houston for swooping in and and, and making their move. And and listen, I don't think Houston is going to go down without swinging here. Um, but no, I, I think the fact you know he said he is trying to get to Houston as well. Um, but I do imagine that, you know, when Bo Davis and, and coach peoples are, are talking to him over the weekend, uh, I imagine that they're going to be putting the pressure on, you know, something that stood out. Um, I know that he mentioned it on the, on your y'all's chat, which I implore everyone to check, check out. But, um, and talking to Rashad yesterday after the offer, you know, he's, he's, you know, when you're in the state of Louisiana, the timing of the offer sometimes matters and sometimes it doesn't. And, um, it didn't really seem to matter too much to, to Rashad. I felt like he was pretty calm, cool, and understands the process has a good head on his shoulders. And um, with that being said, I don't, I do kind of expect things to possibly turn in LSU's favor pretty quickly, um, especially if that visit goes well uh, on Sunday. Yeah. I, I'm interested to see he, he, as much as he expressed his appreciation for Houston and everything, he admitted he knows that LSU is going to make it really tough for him to say no. And there, there's a lot of excitement, obviously, around him, the family, the community, and everybody for for them to know that LSU is a possibility for him. You know, in addition to, to hearing from Frank Wilson and, you know, Bo Davis and Coach Peoples, they maybe should should get a mod bro in his ear who <laughs> some of this kind of feels a little bit reminiscent of – of when Ahmad was committed elsewhere and then the <laughs> offer came and they kind of full court pressed him really quickly and, and it swung around. But I, I don't know that they need to bring in the the heavy hitter from Rustin for this because I think they're they're well they're well positioned to uh to make things more than difficult for him to say no, if not, you know, impossible to say no to a dream opportunity for him to play close to home, close to mom too. You know, you know those Lutcher Bulldogs. I mean, he put John Trey Kirkland in the offer, um, you know. I'm sure, you know, uh, you know, it'll be interesting if he doesn't commit over the weekend during the visit, if he does take the time to get back to Houston, I think that would probably be the big catalyst, what Houston has to hope for, because um, you see the way that Houston is recruiting right now. They just picked up a commitment from a top uh, 30 player in the country next year's class out of Houston. Um, Willie Fritz and the staff are off and running in there. And I don't think it's going to take very long for them to get that program back where they envision it being. Um, I'm, I know they envision Rashad being a big part of that, and they were very high in that commitment. So if things don't happen this weekend, it'll be interesting to see how uh, this goes into the rest of the summer. Yeah, Coach, Frit, Coach, Coach Fritz and company did such a great job throughout their years at Tulane, really building that to the point to where some of those recent recruiting classes were really impressive for the Green Wave. And then obviously you head out to, to H-Town and it's kind of a, a different – arsenal of opportunity there um to to work with in the recruiting game also you mentioned the john trey kirkland tag that for me chatting with rashad was one of those reminders of us getting a little bit older because when he mentioned looking up to john trey kirkland and he felt like he had to kind of explain you know a, a player that that came from lutcher and played at lsu as though that might have been long enough removed that I, I wouldn't remember who he's talking about. And, and that kind of clicked to me of man, John Trey has been out for a while and we've been doing this for a while, <laughs> man. I'll, I'll give you two, two ones off the top of my head that make me feel so old is, you know, our, the, we just mentioned Harlem, you know, Harlem told me early on in his recruitment that he just grew up idolizing Leonard Fournette. And I just think of yeah. our early days at NOLA.com covering, covering Booga and uh, you know, then the other day, uh, this this fantastic corner from Alabama, you know, was talking about his Clemson offer, Andrew Purcell, a four star from Enterprise. And he was saying, you know, the Clemson offer means a lot because, you know, guys like I grew up watching like Trevor Lawrence and Travis ATN. Well, I remember when Travis committed to Clemson, you know, we all we all had that covered. We um, I remember driving to Jennings right after uh, Thanksgiving for him. And he was literally the only one in the school. I like the co the coach. Coach uh, had already left, and he just left the keys with Travis. And then, um, obviously, covering Trevor was equally as fun, if not more fun. But that's a story for a rainy day. <laughs> uh, we are, uh, we are, we are, we are old. Even though people say my age is not old, I feel like I am ninety-seven years old. Oh yeah, I'm falling apart at the seams, man. Um, so we mentioned we were going to hit on the the latest updates with James Simon with Rashad Sterling. Uh, probably not as much to say right now about just kind of the latest with DeCorey and Moore. We talked about 
whenever it was two weeks ago, I think that he had announced his decommitment from LSU. There's been some reports that LSU is, is still in the mix or maybe DeCorian has mentioned that LSU is still in the mix. Do you, how much of it, uh, of a weight do you put on some of those comments or, or reports or, or how much of a grain of assault do you, do you kind of, take with hearing okay after the decommitment announcement and after the release of the visit dates and schedule which didn't include LSU that the Tigers could still be in the mix because I mean I'll, I'll be up front I'm, I'm not thinking too much about it <laughs> yeah I, I'll just piggyback off that listen he might he might get back to Baton Rouge you know he might you know he I know that he'll have a decision made before the end of the summer um you know I, to me the decommitment was was the final you know nail in the coffin um, if he really wanted to continue to consider LSU, I would imagine he would have taken a, an approach more like Terry Bussey is stay committed until you're not. Um, you know, I, I think Texas is the, is the front runner here. Um, you know, but I know that Oregon and Ohio State are both giving DeCorian plenty to think about. Obviously, um, the LSU coaching staff went on, you know, over time and uh, probably, you know, a mixture of BK and Joe Sloan and Coach Hankton were. Um, you know, into Corian and his mom's ears about giving them another shot and obviously originally committing to them for a reason. He's got ties to the state and he grew up watching guys like Odell, if you want to continue to feel old and then Jarvis. And, um, you know, I, you know, like it, I, I think that there's a, there's always going to be a place into Corian's heart. Uh, but from a, from an unbiased recruiting standpoint, I, I think it would be unwise to say that LSU is, you know, has anything more than a puncher's chance in this one. Um, this is really steering toward the finish line, and I think it's already favoring one team pretty severely, and uh, I think two teams are still in, in LSU's way. Yeah, for fans, I, I would say maybe don't rule it 100% out, but don't don't start getting your hopes up based on a tweet or two that you, you've you happened to see this week because it, it doesn't feel like that's particularly substantial. Junk mail. <laughs> Um, and wrapping up, as we mentioned, with some of this news of the kind of mid to late last week, the NCAA settlement, the the Power Five still at this point, because when th- all of this litigation started, the Pac-12 was still a little bit more notable in, in its standing. So the five major college conferences reaching a $2.8 billion settlement, uh, including some back pay to athletes going back to 2016 and kind of has been billed as the the end of amateurism as as we know it for college athletics and setting the stage for schools in the the major conferences to directly pay their student athletes moving forward. We won't talk a ton about it because a lot still seems very much in motion and it's there's just a lot to unpack and a lot that still hasn't been really finalized but your your thoughts on the latest kind of landmark case uh related to the NCA and just kind of the structure of things now is we've, we've been in this ever changing world for a few years now, and it, it's not going to stop changing anytime soon. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's my biggest takeaway is, um, you know, if, if you couldn't tell by now, the NIL part is not going anywhere. It's, it's only becoming more and more um, engraved in, in the way that things are, are going. Um, I've said it multiple times. I don't know if I've gotten to say it on, on recruit that boot, but let me say if now, um, you know, I think running a college football program is basically the equivalent as and as hard and um, strategic as running a, a professional NFL franchise. Um, in addition to drafting your players or, you know, recruiting them and, and developing them on your own, which now requires uh, basically a, a salary cap because it's, it's not easy if you want to have a competitive roster. You have to be equally as dynamic in, in building out your roster through the transfer portal if you want to compete right away. It's not just about a two to four year window. It's a, it's recruiting and, and recruiting transfers and recruiting high school players to win right now. And um, in order to do that, it, it requires the NIL part and collectives are not going anywhere. You've heard a lot of people say that over the past couple of weeks. And um, that's, that's certainly the truth. I'm not going to argue with them. I think the biggest thing is now that we, now that everyone is recognizing that it's here, everyone is recognizing that this is a, a huge component in college football uh, moving forward, how do we continue to legislate it? How do we continue to kind of, you know, maybe try to even the playing field or set some sort of boundaries? I don't know. I don't particularly care too much. It's it's difficult to kind of cover as it is. It's ever changing. We're all getting used to it. So everyone has a different approach. Um, but, you know, 
anything. I think a governing body, the NCAA is, is, is horrible when it comes to governing things. So it's hard to say that they're going to be, you know, legislating uh, the finances of, of, of athletes moving forward. But um, certainly I think it signifies that they are basically getting professional athlete treatment from the time that they are 15 and 16 years old. And God bless all the parents that have to learn all this to guide them through it. Yeah. Hey, look, there are legitimately high school athletes and under underclassmen high school athletes who have not started varsity games yet in the state of Louisiana who are making more in a year right now than I am. Um, and so it's, it's kind of wild times to think about where we're at. I hey, you better get used to that because he's, he's at the top of the, of the poll. So you're just, you're just cashing in on timing right now. You can't say that next, this time, this time next year. The, the amount that we still don't know about what the future looks like is a little bit insane to, to think about. We, we saw how many unanswered questions came out of the NIL ruling and, and just kind of the Pandora's box or, or game of whack-a-mole of, okay, let's address this is, issue. Okay, wait, that opened up this. And it's just chasing around, not realizing what's ahead. And I think what we have seen over the last few years pales in comparison in terms of the amount of change we're about to see over the next few years. And so whatever unanswered questions are, are about to come to the forefront and, and many more subtle changes in reaction to, to that ruling, we're going to look a lot more, at least from the major conferences standpoint, a lot more like professional sports than, ever before. And there's probably going to be a lot more of a divide between those major conferences and, and the, the next tier down. And so I don't know, those are just some initial thoughts, but we're going to be trying to play catch up at every turn for the next few years. It feels like. I'm I'm with you, man. Why don't you um, tease for our, we're we're having such an influx of, of, of viewers these days. Why don't you tease to them what's on the docket for next week? Well, look, now that Rashad Sterling has has come in and and been the closer to get me to start being more active on social media again, I don't know if you maybe had an NIL deal deal with him to complete that job you'd been working on and putting in all those long hours the last couple months. I think we're going to see those those views go up uh, another step, you know, kick it up a notch. Emerald Lagasse. Well, bam. Um, Bam. But the plan right now for next week, unless a, a flood of commitments and decommitments and other news occurs, is I think we want to look a little bit at who are some guys, and we may have just mentioned one of them a few minutes ago, who are not currently in LSU's 2025 class, who we kind of expect if we were forecasting who who ends up in LSU's 2025 class out of the state of Louisiana by the end of it. We'll kind of look at at who some of those candidates are, as well as kind of preview a little bit, as you mentioned before, what this, uh, you know, OT7 national championship event, not this weekend, but next weekend looks like, including a kind of revamped flow roster. You and I will both be out there in Tampa next weekend with those guys. And, uh, and so kind of looking at who are some of the guys that we'll be watching representing the state of Louisiana. Um, you may have some thoughts on some out of state guys you're looking forward to seeing with some other programs as well. Yeah, you can, I'll, you can lead the way on the Louisiana cast and I can try to go uh, at, you know, take the, the field, which is a dangerous game, but we can, we can have some fun with that. Yeah. There's going to be an awful lot of talent down there in Tampa for sure. And it's going to be fun. If the weather is as we anticipate it, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a few really nice, Nice days in sunny Florida watching some fantastic young athletes uh, battle for a national championship. Where? Tampa. You got it. (laughs) There you go. He's Sam Spiegelman. I'm Jarrett Roser. This is Recruit That Boot on the Louisiana vs. All Y'all channel. As always, thank you all for watching, and we'll be tuning back in uh, next week to talk about those topics, some more LSU-based stuff, as well as that OT7 national championship.